Because we know people who should be successful, but what? They're not successful. Why? So that's his why buy. But what is he afraid of? My personal style of education, but still entertain them, bring them along with stories, right? You can't wait to tell your colleague. You can't wait to go to work and tell somebody. And you're like, oh my God, I can't wait. So what happened? If you haven't seen my TV show, you should get cable. That's what we need to do. From doing a TV show to doing corporate events, I've been so lucky to connect with many passionate entrepreneurs worldwide. What I've learned from a business perspective, because this is the formula for success, no matter who you talk to, attitude will drive your behavior. Would you agree? and your behavior will drive your consequences every single time. Right, we got the concept. Okay, we got the concept. We got, we got the equipment, right? We got the brand, you guys got that. And then again, we got the content that we create. That's the easy part. This is the big one, the big C, which is the commitment. What should you do? That's right, all right. 10 Xers, do not fail me. True test, here it comes. There's skill, and then there's will. Listen to what I'm saying. There is skill, and then there is will. And here's the interesting thing. I know a lot of people who have a lot of skill, but have no what? Will, right? You ever look at somebody who's successful, and you say, why them, why not you? Yes, okay, that's me too. You have more control, but your costs are also gonna be what? Higher. Now, here's where some of the magic is starting to kick in. You can talk to any CEO in the B2B business, any CEO. You walk into his office and they only care about three things. People too. Yeah, he with the suit, put it up. There you go. I hope you can see this. I'll try to draw a big. Let's pretend for a moment that I had seven territories. You remember I wrote that out? Yes or no? Boom, territory two, territory three, all the way to territory number one, seven. So now I've segmented my market. So content is going to start being created by machines. And I'm telling you right now that those people, you guys, the content creators that connect with people are the ones that are going to win. Some people think, well, it won't work for my industry. Really? It'll work for any industry. Trust me. The majority of the time when we're looking to fix something, repair something, or learn something, where do we go? YouTube. We don't even want to read anymore. We go to YouTube. Tell me if I'm wrong. Tell me if I'm wrong. When you're doing your thing, beautiful things begin to happen. It's like the law of attraction kicks in. You know what I mean? It's almost like you're in line with the universe. Everything works. And when you do your thing, everybody gets an automatic MBA, which stands for what? Mega bank account money. Are you with me? So we don't want to do a thing. We want to do a what? Beautiful. Put it all together for Victor Antonio. Here we go. All right, there we go. I'm not here to mess around. You ready to learn? Yes or no? That's how it works in today's market. Whether it's B2B or B2C, you see the similar pattern. Oh, how do you just, you know, in other words, say you've got to start doing these things, pushing them, but also encouraging them. Oh, look at this. This work is, dude, this is, this is like so interactive with audience. Can you imagine this with your customers? Check this out. Now, what does all this have to do with selling? It has everything to do with selling. man give it up for chris stone man he's in the chat here man i gotta love that intro man hold on i feel a little tall here i got my like my high gym shoes on let me just kind of 
push back a little bit. But anyway, thank you for joining me on this episode of Sales After Dark. Uh, let's see who's in the house. My man, Inkle John, there he is, man. Uh, hey, man, always here and always excited to pick up what's on your brain, my mind. I, I, was, I consider you as a mentor ever since I came across your channel, man. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. Always appreciate having you here. All the way from the other side of the world, DR Prabhu. Welcome, man. If it's morning, man, thank you for joining us. There she is, the one and only C.F. Jackson in the house. Class is in session. Here he is again, my man, Chris Stone. Again, if you see the intro, you love the intro, give that man credit. Hey, Chris, you know what I found today? I was going through the Outbound Conference um, video folder, and I found a testimonial I did for you. I'm going to have to send that your way, man, in case you've lost it. My girl, where's she at? Oh, shoot, I got to skip everything's moving on my thing here. I'm sorry. Mia Knox, good evening, Mia. What's happening? Always glad you're here, man. You just completed. Anthony, what's up, Vic? What's up, Anthony? All is good, man. Here in Georgia, the big ATL Fabio. Cool name, Vargas. It's been a long time. Happy to be here again, man. It has been a long time. LinkedIn user, New York is in la casa, in the house. Article and design, what an interesting title. Hi, Victor, from Oz Down Under. From Oz Down Under, I don't know what that is. Is it Australia or Oz? My man, always breaking it down in lamest term. What's up, DL in the house. Arvin Garcia, man, it's been a while. Good evening, Victor, from the Philippines. Again, I'm looking forward to doing an event for Ayala Land Premier, which is the huge real estate company out there. Uh, good people, man. And Trond Erickson, man. It's been a while, man. Happy New Year. Right back at you. Victor's back in the saddle again. Edwina, what's happening? I gotta try that name again. Jasarevic? Jasarevic. Tell me if I got if, I, if I'm close, man. Edwina, tell me if I'm close. BS Rao, good morning, man. Where you at, BS? Let me know where you're at, man, before we jump into the nice topic. All right. I'm excited because we're gonna talk about decoy pricing. I'm super excited. In the book, Mastering the Upsell, I'm telling you, this is one of my favorite chapters. And if you master this one, I think uh, you're going to have a good time. By the way, I'm playing with the new camera here. Let me know what you think of it. Boom, look at that. Put the book right there so you can see it. You cannot miss the book right there. That was a gift from Chris Stone right there, that cup, man. So anyway, a little behind the scenes. Let me know if you, think, if you like the angle. If you don't like the angle, I can change the angle. Just let me know, man. Anthony Reed, what's happening? Great to be here. Glad to have you, man. Thank you. Kim Kraft Capo. Hi, Victor, also known as KCC. Just made that up just for you. Uh, let me see. You know I kept that testimonial off the cuff and unexpected. Much respect. Thank you, man. It, it was a good time we had at Outbound Conference. Uh, by the way, uh, Outbound Conference is a conference where a lot of great speakers come there, including yours truly. Uh, if you go to outboundconference.com, you can find out more information. The event's going to be in September here in Atlanta, Georgia. So check out outboundconference.com. And if you use the code of VICTOR100, you get $100 off. So VICTOR100, outboundconference.com. All right, let's jump into this. I'm telling you, this is one of my favorite chapters. It really is. Uh, this is, I'll let you know where it's at. It's right about, bam, right there. Decoys, using decoys. I'm telling you right now. This is a brilliant strategy or strategies that I'm about to show you. So again, uh, for those of you who weren't here in the last two sessions, I'm going to be going through the whole book. So if you haven't ordered it on Amazon, the question is, why haven't you ordered the book on Amazon? Look, man, I made it affordable. Look, see that? I made it affordable. You can afford It's affordable. It's a great book. Uh, you'll walk out with some great strategies. So we're going to cover again decoys. So let's get into it, because I, I definitely want to get into this subject, man. I really want to get into this subject. I was first introduced to decoy pricing uh, by Dan Ariely. Uh, he's a neuroscientist, uh, and there was a study I want to read here. It says, are we in control of our own decision? And he wrote a book called Predictably Irrational, right? It's a great book. And in here, he introduced the concept of decoy pricing. So I'm going to show you three different studies on decoy pricing, this is the first one. Again, Dan Ariely's book. Check it out. So bottom line is they, they put these subscriptions up, right? They wanted to sell these. This is TheEconomist.com wanting to sell these subscriptions. And so one was at $59 online, but if you get the print version, it was $125. Now, which one do you think most people bought? Come on. 
Was it that one or was it that one? That one or was it that one? What do you think? Come on, vote. This is print, online. Come on, put print or online in the chat. Print or online in the chat. And I'll give you 10 seconds. 10, nine, three, two, one. If you guessed online, you're absolutely right. They went for the cheaper ones. Remember when we talked in the last session on pricing, that when you offer two options and people are unsure, they will always mitigate their risk by choosing the, more, the less expensive one. I don't want to say the cheaper one, the less expensive one, right? So that's what typically happens. Now they wanted to find out how could we get people, how could we nudge them? In other words, how do we get them from here and just push them over here so they can buy this right here, right? And so they decided to do to add a decoy. This is the concept of a decoy. And I'll explain what a decoy is in just a bit, but let's go through the example first. Then the results were as follows. If you look at the numbers, when they did the study, just to kind of give you actual numbers, again, web only, the $59, 68% of the people bought, and print and web, $125, 32% bought. Now here's what they then did. Based on 100 buyers, their revenues was $4,000. You can run the numbers right there. And then 125 times 32, there you go, total revenue of $8,000, right? And again, what they want to know now is can they push people over here and how do you do that? Well, then they introduced this decoy price. Now, here's what's interesting. Here's what they're offering. So you got the subscription, right? The online, you got the online subscription, you got the print subscription, and now you got print and online subscription, right? You got them both, right? So again, you got them both, you got print, and then all the way over, you got the online. But notice what they did to the price. Notice here, something weird is going on because this price looks a heck of a lot like that price right there, right? Kind of weird, right? It's kind of like it doesn't make sense. So if I understand this right, so here they're just gonna give you again, online version, we'll call it online. Here's the print version, and for both of them, but again, the price is exactly the same. What do you think happened? What do you think happened? Did they go for number one? Did they go for number two? Or did they go for number three? Come on, put that in the chat. Did they go for number one? Did they go for number two? Or did they go for number tray? Come on, hit me in the chat. What did they do? What did they do? One, two, three. You got to get this. You got to get this. Because, again, once you begin to understand the psychology of using decoys, you're going to use it a lot. So we're getting three, three. We got two votes for three. Kim is in for three. Uncle John is in for three. Let's get this baby rolling. Come on, who else? Edwina says three. Mm, interesting. Sam says two. Sam is saying no. Sam is going two. Natalie's going three. Anthony's in for three. Perunica. Kaba, I'm just, so, I'm just gonna stay there. CFS is three. Marilyn says hi. What's happening? Marilyn, we're in the middle of doing something right now. So anyway, Chris says two. And the answer is, here's what they found. Based on 100 buyers, here's what they found. 16 bought the $59 one. So 16 bought that one right there, right? And then nobody bought number two. Oh, if you chose number two, you were so wrong. Like beyond wrong, okay? Like more than wrong. Like so far wrong, it's like, why are you here, right? That's how wrong you are. <laughs> Just kidding. Anyway, and then look at this. For those of you who said three, Chad Perez said three, Matt said three. You guys are on it, man. So everybody who said three, you got it. So psychologically, I mean, again, it's kind of intuitively obvious. By adding this, people go, wait a minute, but if I'm going to pay... You know, if I'm going to pay the 125, I might as well just get the one with both, right? Why don't I just get, you know, just these two? Why don't I get both? But here's what happened. As soon as they added this right here, all of a sudden, your attention shifted from here, the cheapest one, to considering these two. So the decoy is used to shift your attention away from what they don't want you to buy. Let me say that again. A decoy is used in this case to shift your attention from what they don't want you to buy. We can also use, you can also kind of talk about the opposite, right? Maybe they used it to push you to what they wanted you to buy, right? And so we're going to talk about different examples of that, but that's how you begin to think about decoy pricing. So again, there's the logic. And by the way, if you look at the revenue increase, look at this. This is incredible. If you think about it, just by using this simple strategy, using this simple strategy, total revenues increased by 
43%. Wow. By the way, simple strategy. Now notice that they increase revenue by 43% without having to pressure anybody. This is all online, so there's no pressure. There's no heavy pitching going on. There's no persuasion techniques or influence techniques being used. Well, I guess influence is being used, but there's no hard pressure sales to buy the most expensive one. So what if you can increase your proposal deals just by simply introducing decoys, which is what I want to talk to you about now. And again, if you haven't checked out the book, Mastering the Upsell, let me play my little camera again. There's the book. By the way, I'm asked about this um, picture. My daughter created this picture, right? And so everything in here on this means something. For example, the diamonds right here on the head, that's actually a story called the Acres of Diamonds, right? And there's a popcorn, which I'm going to talk about the popcorn test. Uh, there's a shark fin right there. Uh, there's a Volvo right there. We'll talk about that. There's a camel right there. So everything on this book, if you look at the cover, everything has meaning. So my daughter designed that. I'm very proud of her. Camille, way to go. All right. So there's an introduction to decoy pricing, but that's only one example. Let's push further, right? Now, let's talk about the popcorn test. Man, so by the way, there's a link below. The National Geographic Popcorn Experiment, it's called. So there was an experiment done on popcorns, right? Now imagine you're going to the theater. And again, let's assume it's 100 people. You're going to the theater. You're, you're going to the theater, and all of a sudden, the small popcorn is $3. The large popcorn is $7. All right, this is where you can reclaim your dignity right now. Did most people choose the $3 one or the $7 one? The $3 one or the $7 one? Which one did they choose? Come on, come on, come on. If you guessed two on the last one, now's the time to redeem yourself. Now's the time to redeem yourself. Uh, by the way, thank you for the comments on the side. Somebody says, oh, your daughter, yes. Natalie says, oh, well done to your daughter. She's awesome. She's, by the way, her nickname is The Great One. So the G1 did a fantastic job for me. So anyway, the majority of people are going to buy. If I got a $3 popcorn, $7 popcorn, which one did most people buy? Come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on. What they buy, what they buy, what they buy? Three, three, I got some seven. Kim says seven. Mia knocks, my girl says seven. Uh, Edwina says three. Pablo is saying large double XL, man. Dude, leave the room. <laughs> okay. Uh, the answer is that the majority of people bought, come on, you should have gotten this. It was so easy. This was like a layup. All right, listen carefully. The answer was three. And if you didn't get this one, how? How can you not get this one? I've been training. Remember, when two options are offered and people are not sure, the brain will mitigate the risk and go with the cheapest version. So the winner is number three. So disappointed in some of you. B.S. Craig, you guys are just hungry. I'm, just, I'm assuming that you guys are just hungry. All right. So the majority of people chose the, uh, the $3 one. So if we run numbers here, again, if we just put the numbers up here, uh, again, hypothetical situation if you run the numbers. Let's say that, again, 80 people bought multiply, 80 people who bought the most expensive one multiplied by the least expensive one, $3, 240 20 people, $7, 140 bucks. They made 380 bucks, right? Numbers. Now, Part two, decoy. Remember, we're talking decoy pricing here. Now, let me ask you a question. Again, this is, I'm really testing you guys tonight. Be careful, really think about this one. Listen to me, listen to me. Think about this one before you answer. Just really think about it. So they thought about, I said, okay, what we wanna do is create a third option. But they're gonna put the third option between three and seven. They're going to put the third option between three and seven. Okay, so that's the price range. They're going to put third option. Now, listen carefully. Where would you set the price to maximize revenue? Ooh, I'm giving you a hint here. Where would you, ma where would you put the price to maximize? Huh? Where would you put the price to maximize revenue? Let me give, okay, let me, let me ask the question another way. Would you put it closer to three or would you put it closer to seven or would you just put it right in the middle? Put your number in there. Edwina says five, Jay says 650. Uh, let me see. Uncle John says $5. Michael 625, you're so specific, that's funny. Uh, dude, you can't put it at seven. Kim, you, got, you can't have two pop, Kim. 
Get out of here. Just just leave, Kim. You can't have two at seven. Give me another number, man. Kent says six dollars. Chris Stone's in the five. Perenica. I mean, I'm, anyway, I, I'm sorry if I got that wrong. Matt says six. Uh, Jason DeMarco is three seventy-five. Five dollars. Five dollars. Okay, closer to seven. Thank you for the obvious, Chris. Uh, that's not helping. Four dollars. Five dollars. Five ninety-nine. You've been reading a lot of persuasion books. Five ninety-nine. If you just said five ninety-seven, that would have been even better. All right. So, all right. Increase the larger to ten dollars, Craig. You're, I mean, I'm with you, but that's not part of the study, Craig. I'm with you, but that's not part of the study, right? All right. The answer is what they found is that they put a decoy at six fifty. Now, when they put the decoy at six fifty, something interesting happened. Now, in other words, when they put it at six fifty, let me just kind of erase that right there. When they put it at six fifty, all of a sudden. What happens is that, now remember, if it's $3, let's go back. If it's $3 versus $7, you're like, $3 versus $7, oh, it might be too big. Let's just go with the small one, right? That's the thought process. But as soon as you introduce a decoy, now what's your thought process? Now you're looking at all three and you go, most people always gravitate towards the middle, almost automatically. So if you said $5, I get you, I'm with you. But by moving it closer to this one, what happens mentally is you just start considering these two and you immediately forget about this one. And then when you're thinking at 650, so you've decided already to nix this one. Okay, we've nixed that one, right? Now you're considering these two. Now what is your brain saying? What is your, I mean, put yourself in that position. You're at the theater, you're about to get into the movie, you're really just thinking about these two. What are you saying to yourself? You know, for, 50 cents more, I might, might as well just get the big one, right? All of a sudden, your thought pattern changes. This is interesting because your thought pattern just changes. Your brain starts considering these two, but then says, you know, for 50 cents more, why not just get the big one? And all of a sudden, guess what happened? People started buying the bigger one. And again, this study's online on YouTube. Small popcorn, 10 people bought it, and then 10 people bought the 650, but look at that the majority of people shifted to the most expensive popcorn. Isn't that interesting? Just, but it's, again, it's the whole thought process. And in this case, look at this number, and that's the dollar that's supposed to be 72%. So sales went up by 72%. 72% without pressuring people, moving people, they just went up. I mean, this is, is it amazing or is it just me? I think this is amazing stuff. Cause it's like, again, what I love about this decoy pricing strategy, it's a way of shifting people's thought process without trying to persuade them. You're just presenting pricing. So that's example number two. So let me see, uh, let me see. Only 50 cents more, Michael, you got it, right? For just 50 cents more, most of you got it. Now buy the $7 one, yep. We don't really have a choice. You don't really have a choice, man. All right, Inco, I agree with you. It's a brilliant idea. All right, one more example. Well, kind of two, but one more, really. Now, let's again, one more example of decoy pricing. And again, all this stuff is in the book. Uh, and, and a lot of the psychological explanation is also in the book as well. But let's go to this one right here. Let's say, let's go full screen on this one. Let's go full screen here now. Let's go full screen. So all of a sudden, you got two restaurant options. Two restaurant options. You got restaurant A, that's a five-star restaurant, but it's a little, it's almost like 30 miles away, 30 minutes away, right? That's a little far, right? Now, you got a three-star restaurant, but it's almost like around the block, five miles, so to speak, five minutes rather. So which one would most people choose? Now, this is interesting because it really depends because if you look at just these two options, most people would go for what? B, right? Most people would just probably go for B. Let me change the colors on here. Most people would just go for B, right? So if they go for B, uh, but again, if they like classy food, they'll probably go here. Right? So it depends. I mean, this is an By the way, I love this one because it's an interesting one. If you're like hungry, you'll probably go for the three star restaurant. I would. Because I get hangry. Who gets hangry? Hit me with a one if you get hangry. And if you don't know what hangry is, it's when you're hungry and you get angry at the same time. Hangry. Right? And so if I was hangry, then I would definitely go for B, right? Even though it's only a three star. But if I wasn't hangry and I was, you know, I'd probably go for this one right here. Now, Having said that, is there a way for me to nudge you 
one way or another? Is there a way for me to nudge you one way or another? And the answer is, I probably could do it. I probably could. So all I do is introduce a what? A decoy. So let's say that now I gave you three options. Now I give you three options, right? You got the three star that's only five minutes away, more or less. You got this one that's about, I don't know, about 22, 23 minutes away, that's A. And then I put the C choice, which is a little over four stars, but it's a little further. What do you think begins to happen automatically? What do you think begins to happen? You get it. What happens is, and again, I explain this in the book, the psychology is that we tend to group things because we need to compare things. For example, in this case, and I want to go slow here because this is important. In this case, our brain needs to compare. It's like if something stands by itself as a price, we go, oh, is that a good price or is it a bad price? I don't know. Is it a good price or a bad? I don't know. I don't know, right? But you need something else. Once you have something to compare to, then you kind of do this. Remember in the last session, we talked about the bread makers? There was one bread maker, I think at 329, and then they introduced one at 425, and then people started buying the cheaper one. If there's only one, they weren't selling a lot. But once they introduced a more expensive one, everybody started buying the cheaper one because they could compare. That's how your brain works. There's something called the compromise effect, which I talked about in the last one. And again, once we can compare two things, we can make a decision based on two things. But if we're just deciding one, we're like, what do we compare to? So as soon as you introduce a decoy, here's what's fascinating, your brain basically discounts this one and begins to compare these two right there. It's really fascinating. So all of a sudden, you're not looking at this one anymore. You're not looking at B anymore. You're looking at A and C, and now you're going to make your decision based on A and C. And again, this is called asymmetrically dominating alternatives. Here, so you can see the full title of that thing. Isn't that a wonderful title? Confusing as hell, but I didn't make it up, right? This is part of the research. So this is one way that we make a decision. Now, I'm going to give you an easy one here, and I can begin to close out with this. And that is, when you look at this right here, if I wanted to move you this way, and by the way, which one do you think they chose, A or C? Oh, let's do this. I forgot to do this one. Did they choose A or C? Come on, which one do you think they chose? I mean, I already helped you out by telling you they didn't choose B, so it's not B. Did they choose A or C? Come on. What do you guys got? A or C? When the decoy was introduced, A or C? A or C? Come on, walk it through. Let's see what you guys got. Inkle John says A. Who else? Who else? Kim says A. Be bold. Come on. Make that commitment. Make that commitment. And I'm glad a lot of you understood hangry. Uh, Matt says A. We've got a lot of A's here, man. A, 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 A. Well done. Well done. Well done. Let me see. Okay. All right, a lot of A's here. You guys are really sure. Uber Eats. <laughs> well done. Uh, C, uh, Peronica says, she's going to kill me for this if I, say, if I say her name wrong. James says C. Uh, James Oi, I love that name. James Today. Uh, Mia says 1A. <laughs> All right, great. Uh, cool. The answer is, boom, A. It shows A. Shia got it. Way to go, Shia. You guys got it. So anyway, the reason is, again, it's, it was right in between. So that's kind of what they went for. Now let's use another example. Now, this time, I give you three choices. But now, I give you these two choices here. Now, I'll put one right here. D is a little over two stars, but it's about 20-minute drive. So if I, let me go full screen so you can see that. In this case, which one would you choose? Which one would you choose? Well, you know what happens again automatically, right? So I'm not trying to trick you here. So all of a sudden, because again, I need something that's close in economic distance. That's a good phrase. It's close in economic distance for me to compare. So as soon as I see these three options, all of a sudden, I'm going to look at these three. What do you think it is? I don't even want to give you the answer yet. What is? We got, so Arvin says A. What do you guys got? Is it A, B, or D? A, B, or D? Kim says B. Arvin, I think, is still saying A from this one, not the last one, okay? Inc. was saying B. Come on. Let's see. Who else? Come on. Come on. Come on. Keep going, guys. Keep going. Keep going. I know we got a delay in the system, Matt. Jay says B. What else? James says A. Oh, man. All right. Wait for a couple of more. D. D. Okay, cool. Cool, cool. A, B, or D. A, B, or D. You're sensing that decoy, aren't you, CF? You're sensing that decoy. All right. P. 
Apparently Uber Eats did not deliver. You're going, Matt's going with the B. Chris is going with the B. Fun to, is that fun? Fun to, fun, yeah. Double F is going B. Ted Candy's going B. PK, I'm gonna call you PK, is going B. And Jerome's going A. And the answer is, bam, B. Now again, what happens is that these two are closer in, in this case, star distance ranking. So it's almost like they're grouped together. And this one's an outlier. And because it's an outlier, it's automatically discounted, much like the popcorn effect, right? The $3 one, the $7 one, when you look at the 550, the top two are considered. So it's almost like you can do this with, it's, it's grouping things together. And by the way, real estate people do this a lot. What they'll do is they'll show you a house here, for example, uh, just forget restaurant, this could be the price of a house. So what they'll do is they'll show you a real expensive one here. Let's say it's $500,000, right? $500,000 and you'll go, whoa, that's a lot of money. But then here they'll show you one that's 400 and then this one is 375. All of a sudden, you'll group these two together, these two houses, because this one seems like an outlier. And these two, you can actually compare the two houses in terms of square footage and so on. So my question to you is, how would you use this strategy in your business? How would you use it? As you're putting together a proposal, how would you use it? The obvious answer is to kind of really push people one way or another. Let me give you kind of one way you can use it in a proposal, and then I'll close out. And that is, again, here's how you can use it in a proposal. Let's say you had just a simple proposal, right? And again, I'm just being very general here with this example. And so in this proposal, for example, uh, option A would be the first option I would offer. And then it, had, it includes features A through F. I'm making this out. And that's gonna cost you $100 per month, right? And then, or you, you can go with option B, which includes A through F, but all the way through W. So which one would most people buy? You know the answer. The majority of people would buy what? This one, because it's cheaper. It had, this one is more expensive, but they'd rather go with the cheaper one. So then what you're gonna do is insert a decoy, something you know that most people aren't gonna really buy. So you might insert something like this. Now, all of a sudden, that's 100, that's 180, that's 200. What do you think people are gonna do? You guessed it, they're gonna compare what? these two and decide between those two. So that's one simple way of using it in a proposal. And again, I wanted to share this with you. So if you haven't checked out that book, you should check out that book. Uh, like I said, it's on Amazon, you guys can get it there. And I think that's all I had. Here are the big takeaways, by the way. The big takeaways are the following. One, one, with no intrinsic understanding of value, the brain looks to compare it with some reference point. So the brain is always trying to compare. So when you offer, <clears throat> excuse me, a client just one option, they don't know what to compare it to. And by the way, there is a way they can compare it. They can find a competitor's bid and compare it. So instead of letting them compare it to a competitor's bid, you want to offer at least two options. Never just give them one option, minimum two options. Number two, you can control the reference point by introducing a decoy into your proposal. Remember, a, a control of reference is, where do I put the third pricing? Much like I just did with the proposal, there was 100, 180, and then 200. By introducing a decoy, I now want them to focus on the 180 and 200. In the popcorn example, by introducing 650, I want them to focus on 650 and $7. Bottom line is, use decoys to move buyers towards or away from a single option. And that is all I wanted to talk about today. But anyway, so anyway, leave me some comments on what you think. And again, I think the, I'll take some questions right now and let me see what I had the last page, that's for tomorrow. But anyway, so any questions, concerns before I sign out? I'm trying to keep these shorter. I think last year I was going for like an hour or two hours. So, all right, so I must've missed some comments. Putting decoys in our proposal, uh, Jay says, when customers have only two options, they have a dilemma. When you give them three options, they can make a smart decision. I think so. Paco Lebron, my homie, what's happening? Best improvement tactic to our business sales. Thanks to Victor. Thank you very much. And happy New Year to you, man. We haven't talked in a while. We have to connect again. Inkel says, thank you so much for great insights. Always, man. You have a great and talented family. Yeah, the great one's great. You also have a son who composed one of your intro songs, right? Yes, my son did the intro song 
for the actual sales after dark. So that music, he goes under Lumera Music. So if you go to, if you want to check out some of his music, it's free. If you go to Lumera music.com you will hear by the way that's his nickname i i know him as vic three he's, he's victor three i'm victor two he's victor three the third revision until god gets it right but if you go to lumeromusic.com uh that's him man so thank you for bringing that up i and i i should have mentioned that earlier when customers did their research on what our competitor is offering we will give them two options uh, one of them will be a decoy. There you go. Great information. On a side note, my kids, four, three, and one, were crowding the screen watching this. Love them. Let's train them early, Anthony. Let's train some real sales kids. Come on, guys. Come on, guys. Let's huddle. This is me and your, your three kids, man. Let's huddle. Let's, let's go make some money like that. We can buy all the toys and candy we want and make dad angry. No, no not really. Uh, I received the book on Saturday. A lot of awesome information. Mike Glenn, thank you. The front cover is very unique, has a lot of activity. <laughs> the back cover has a lot of symbolism also. Can you go over the back cover? Thanks for writing the book. The back cover, let me see the back cover. This one has, oh man, this is, uh, so this is part Acre of Diamonds, right? This is using different funnels. I talk about uh, decision fatigue. That's the pool one right here. And again, my daughter did this one. I forgot what the plane one was. I think we talked about airline tickets or something, so that might be in there as well. And we wanted to give it more of a, I don't know, a more exaggerated look. My daughter also, I'm sure, buried some nuggets or Easter eggs in that cover. So I let her have like free reign on the cover when she showed it to me. I have to be honest, I was like, okay, that's different. Not what I expected. But the response to the actual cover and everything have been Fantastic. So I wanted to do something different. Everybody does the big letters, and I just wanted to do something different. So anyway, but thank you for asking, Mike. And if I miss something, I'll mention it next time. Uh, James Oy says, great job. Lumera Music, you got it until God gets it right. That's right, third revision. Uh, thank you for the information. PK, great information. Thank you for joining us. Double F, great insight, sir. What's two advantages of two over three options? There isn't really, I mean... I don't want to say there's a hard advantage, Fantouche. I don't want to say that you can, you shouldn't offer three. Uh, two's fine. I mean, I've seen people just offer two options. Uh, it depends if you if you only have two options to work with. That I mean, that's what you offer. And I'm trying to think in my brain of a situation where two or three would be better than two. I like three because if I offer two options, the majority of people are going to shift towards the actual bottom, right? So the advantage of three options is that if I wanted to move up in price point, that's what I would do. I mean, if you have to, use to, but I would try to create three options. I mean, you see it all over the internet, right? Uh, silver, gold, platinum, right? Or bronze, silver, gold. So everything's three because it's just the way our brains work. So I think by using three options, you can move people up the price point ladder and make more money that much faster. In other words, your income goes up, as I showed with some of these examples. Uh, but great question. How many options are too many options? I think beyond three, Pablo, is too much. I was looking at a website the other day, and it had four options. And I got to be honest, I, got, I just kind of like, okay, this is too much. It was like, it, it just felt like it was too much. Uh, so I think three, I would never go more than five. I mean, that would be the extreme of providing options. But, you know, the thing is, there's several ways you can attack. Let's say you have to offer multiple options. What I would then do, and it's a good question you bring up, is I would funnel people into options. So, for example, let's say I had five options. Let's say I have five options. And so let's go A, B, C, D, E. Now, this is going to assume that you're talking to a client, right? It's face-to-face. -face. So you got five options. This is where you as a salesperson have to guide them into making a buying decision. So let's say towards the end of the presentation, I said, look, we have five options we can look at. And then I do the presentation, do a lot of Q&A, discovery, present. And then as I get to the end, I said, Mr. Customer, based on what you've told me, I, I, I look at my five options to consider. I would not recommend A or B. What I would do is look at these three, B, D, and E, and here's why. And then I would talk some more. And then, again, I would funnel them to two options, right? Because now it could be B and E. And then they'll make a decision. So there's a way of funneling people during a conversation. And I think customers like this. I like Customers like to have a lot of options. But what they need you to do 
is to guide them, narrow the options for them. And this is our job. Our job is not to sell only. It's to help funnel them into a logical sequence so they can make a buying decision. Let me know if that helped, if I answered your question. Uh, I'm still using your uh, FBA strategy from how to sell your product and service. How can I use that on our comparative analysis over my competition? So, so by the way, FBA feature benefit analysis. I think in one of my videos, uh, by the way, if you haven't checked out the Sales Velocity Academy, most of you know what it is. It's my academy, Sales Velocity Academy. Sorry for having to write this out. I should have had if you go to salesvelocityacademy.com, uh, I think there's a video there, and I, I forgot the name of which one it is, but I do this comparative matrix, right, where I talk about all the features and benefits up here, and this is your company, and this is competitor one, competitor two, and competitor three, right? And then what you can, you've seen these things where here's, you have all these features, right, and maybe they have this. And one of the things I love about a comparative matrix like this is that visually you can see why you have the advantage, right? And so I want to make sure I understood your question because it's about pricing. How can I use a comparative analysis over my competitors? Well, the thing is, one way of doing it, Arvin, is you determine what the features are up here. So, for example, it does feature one, feature two, feature three, feature four, feature five. So if I put this matrix together for the customer, I used to do this all the time, by the way, I put the features I know I have and my competitors don't. So immediately, my customer sees the what? They see the gaps, the products they don't have or the features they don't have and I make it very obvious. And as you can see, Mr. Customer, for the same price, you can have all this and the price is this, right? Another way of using this is, is that if you have, let's say, a lot of features and maybe your competitors have a lot of features also, I would then offer all these features and a second price. So this will be a hundred, I'm gonna make a number up. All this product costs a hundred thousand dollars, but if you include our service option, it'll be hundred twenty thousand dollars and it includes something else. I would package it like that. I'd have to know specifically what it is, but this is how I use the matrix when I sold. I would always like, after the presentation, I would then, because I knew my, by the way, I only did this because I knew that my client, my potential customers or clients were gonna bring up the competitors. Or sometimes if I waited, if they brought up the competitor, I would actually have slides ready to compare the differences. So that's how I would use a comparative analysis. Great question, man. CF, you're very welcome, man. Two options is good when it is a simple decision. For example, should we meet in the morning or the afternoon? Perfect example of using a two option deal. And that's more just option in general. Eric and Papa Klein here. Eric, what's happening? Papa Klein, man. Sending you blessings, man. It's amazing. So, Eric, next time in Florida, man, I'll give you a call. We have to get together. CF, this strategy makes me look priced, look at price totally different because I am pricing to guide them with better intentions. And that's it. You're not guiding them to kind of misinform them. So we're not creating pricing just to deceive them. Is that we want to make money. And if we can present them with options, the full range of the options, why not do it in such a way that makes it easier for them to make a buying decision? So I love that. Uh, Fontus says, simply great. Logic and sales can go together. I think you're right. I think you're right. By the way, you know, if you think about sales, it's both art and science. So anyway, on that note, I'm going to start exiting out of here. Check out the book, Mastering the Upsell. And again, if you haven't gotten your copy, why not? Uh, we'll be going into the next chapter on Thursday. In fact, Thursday, I will not be available. I'll be... I think I'll be on the road or won't be available on Thursday. So I will see you next Tuesday. On that note, this is Victor Antonio always reminding you that selling ain't hard when you know how.